Good evening. Welcome to Hastings Mystery Theater. I'm your host and mystery master, Randall Schaefer. Tonight, the corridors of mystery take us to 1934 for a Willis Kent production, Murder in the Museum. A city councilman suspects that a sideshow museum of oddities is a front for selling drugs. The disreputable reputation of the sideshow adds to his suspicions. When the city councilman is murdered, the owner of the sideshow is a suspect. His daughter teams up with a young reporter to exonerate her father. Our lead tonight is Henry Walthall, a major star during the silent era, but by this movie his career was almost over. Our other leads are Phyllis Barrington and John Heron, who play the young couple. Phyllis Barrington was born in Maine in 1907. She had a very short career before leaving Hollywood, and she died in 1996 at age 87. John Heron was born in New York City in 1903. His older brother was a silent movie actor, but he died under some mysterious circumstances that have to this day never been explained. Well, John looked pretty much like his brother, so he fell into the same kind of roles. By the beginning of the sound era, his career, too, was in decline. In 1939, he finished a movie and went to Washington State to relax and do some fishing. He developed spinal meningitis and died suddenly while in Washington at age 36. Let's return to 1934 and enjoy Murder in the Museum. We don't like to take big bills. That's the smallest I have, but that bill's all right. Oh, allow me. Oh. Thank you. Now, right over here, folks. Right over here. Here's the next attraction. Right over here. Gather around, folks. Gather around. Here we are, folks. Right over here now. Right over here. Here we have Keturah, the seeress, endowed with an account wisdom of a forgotten civilization. She reads your past and delves into your future. For 50 cents a half a dollar, ladies and gentlemen, she will tell you what the future has in store for you, advise you in business, aid you in a happy solution of your love affair. She's uncanny, she's supernatural, and all her mystic powers at your command for the trifling sum of 50 cents a half a dollar. Now, who's going to cross her palm here, gentlemen and ladies? Will somebody uh, have their fortune told? Step in there. Well, well. Well, I guess that'll be all now, folks. We have unexpected guests, I see. Yeah, Blair Newgate, if that means anything to you. It doesn't, I regret to say. It will, but you lose your meal ticket if he closes this fix up. Is that Newgate in the center? 
No. That's Brandon, a police commissioner. Right over here now, the next flat. Right over here, ladies and gentlemen. Despite his tragic handicap, folks, this harmless artist not only dresses, shaves, and feeds himself on aided, but creates these beautiful artistic gems on sale to you for 25 cents a quarter of a dollar. Now, who is going to buy one, folks? Will somebody buy one of these beautiful artistic gems? They're 25 cents. 25. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Newgate's that blue-nosed city councilman that's been shooting his mouth off in the papers lately about dope peddling and vice conditions in this end of town. I remember. Wasn't there something in the Times Herald last night about his intention to investigate a certain cheap Darrell Street show? Yeah. Well, that's him. I seem to recall his somewhat unflattering description of yourself as the ex-jailbird owner. Yeah. That dirty snooper. Do you imagine he's brought the police commissioner along to help him officiate? That's what I can't understand. Those two hate each other like poison. They're both running for mayor. And Newgate's hollering, clean up! to try and rope in the reform vote. You know he doesn't want Brandon muscling in on his glory. Maybe he won't pull anything today. Well, if he does, I presume there's no evidence around. That's the trouble. The mix brought in some stuff last night. It's in the back room. But he won't get as far as the back room. And now, folks, by special permission of the safety department and the NRA, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the great Darrow in the most hazardous, death-defying exhibition known to the amusement world, the Circle of Death. Watch Pedro Darrow encircle this lovely lady in a ring of flashing steel. Watch him cut away her dress. One little miss, one slip, and she must pay with her life. The great Darrow. So sorry. Oh. oh, that's quite all right. I shouldn't have blocked traffic. Well, the next time I'll blow my horn. Well, I don't think we can accomplish anything here by going ahead today. This crowd will hamper us. <laughs> Not much of a crowd. True, but if there should be any trouble, some bystander might get hurt. I see. If you imagine I'm delaying because I'm afraid of this... The outfit. press is here. Ross of the Times Herald. This sort of forces your hand, Newgate. You'll have to go ahead now. I didn't want any reporters tagging us today. Hello, gentlemen. Well, well, what are you doing here? Oh, uh, your secretary told me you were out on some private business. Oh, I came down here on the chance this was it. When do the fireworks begin? Hello, Uncle. Lois, what on earth are you Sorry, doing? I saw your conversation at breakfast this morning. I, I thought this might be amusing. Oh. Well, aren't you going to present your friend? I beg your pardon, my dear. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is my niece, Miss Brandon. Councilman Newgate. How do you do? Mr. How do you do? Judson. How do you do? And, uh, our, uh... Ross is the name. Mr. Ross. I'm delighted to know you. How do you do? I shall make ready for my act. Perhaps I can divert thy interest. Yeah. I'll put the girl's head. Mr. 
lot of money. Yeah, yeah, I think so, too. Oh, did you hear Say, that girl, last night? What? the law's in here this afternoon. They'll better tame it down plenty. I think we'll put the jip on them inside. Okay, you fix the props. Sure. Oh. Well, he's got a lot of nerves, hasn't he? Well, they come around this joint for all the time. I don't know. They're always pissed. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the marvel of all mysteries, Professor Misto. Well, naked women. I was only looking at the pictures. Oh, don't you talk to me. And now we will pass over here to the favorite of the ladies, Punch and Judy. <laughs> and now, gentlemen, while the ladies are being entertained, if you will follow me down to the other end of the museum, I have an attraction of great interest to you. Right this way, gentlemen, right down here. Right this way, boys, follow me right down here. Gentlemen, I introduce to you Fatima, little Egypt, the daughter of the Nile, and the famous dance that has entertained the crown heads of the world down through history. Why, kings have abdicated, empires have fallen under the spell of the magic little Fatima's wiggle. And gentlemen, you can get the same thrill of thrills for a dime ten cents. Why, she shakes the shimmy better than any shimmy shaker has ever shaken the shimmy before, gentlemen. It's exciting. It's sensational. It's astounding. And you can see the same thrill of thrills for a dime ten cents. Right over there, gentlemen, the box office. It's exciting. It's astounding. Come on, Judson. Let's see what this is. Lois, wait here a moment. Ross will take care of you. All right, Uncle. She shakes the shimmy like you have never a nice seen uncle you've got before. there. It's exciting. It's alluring. And all for a Boy, dime, all ten cents. Time. Right over at the box office, boys. Right, boys. Ten cents. Right a dime, ten cents, a tenth of a dollar. It'll be all right. And now, Fatima, the great Fatima, will shake the shimmy as you have never seen it shaken before. Come on, baby. Come on, this is an outrage. It's plain robbery. What do you expect for a dime? The streets of Paris? If you're not satisfied with the show, stop on the door at the way out and get your money. I'll fix you for this, you cheap swindlers. And now, boys, that the law is gone, I'm going to give you an opportunity to see a real show. The price will be 25 cents. Step right over this way. I'm going to put on a real performance for you. It's a quarter. 25 cents. Right in this way, boys. Just right here. Pay here a quarter. Thank you. 25 cents. Well, it better be good. 25 cents in here. Just a quarter. 25 cents. A quarter. Pay here a quarter. 25 cents. See the girls dance. 25. Thank you. 25 cents in here. Thank Better you, Better be good, too. Thank you, sir. I now present Carmelita. Oh, boy. Hey, hey, now, that's worth the money, boys. That's worth the money. Nice. 
I don't know. Can I do anything? I don't think so. Stay here, O'Malley. Come with me. The rest of you boys cover the place. Okay. Come on, open up here. Get out of the way. Come on. Right, out of the way. Well, Commissioner, what is this? Never mind that now. A man's badly hurt. I'll call an ambulance. That's no, okay. I phoned for one before I called the paper. Why isn't it here? I'll call again. How the rackets work. Yeah, and if you think it's a soft job, you're crazy. Get over in line. Come on. Who are you? My name's Judson. I'm a friend of Mr. Brandon. Oh, came here with Commissioner Brandon, huh? Yes. And you? I am what is referred to on the outside as one of the attractions. I came to offer my assistance when I saw this man fall. Oh, you saw him fall, did you? Did you see what direction the shot came from? It might have come from any direction, as far as I could judge, from where I stood on the platform. I see. What did you say your racket here was? I perform what the posters modestly describe as mind-mystifying feats of illusion. Oh, magic stunts, huh? Let's see what you can show in the way of deadly weapons. Till so you find nothing that would kill even one of my rabbits. Hmm. How about you? Me? Why, well, I haven't anything. Well, we'll just take a look. Frisky, Mac. Show was a bit rougher than you expected, wasn't it? Well, I guess I'm next, Lieutenant. I'm sorry, Commissioner, but I guess it's in line of duty. Aren't you supposed to be rushing back to your newspaper to have them hold the presses or something? Well, I caught the next edition with the story. Now I'll have to hang around to see if there are any developments for a follow-up. You know, coming here today was a break for me, in more ways than one. A break? Yep, this is my lucky day, scooping a murder yarn and meeting you. Really, Mr. Roth, I hardly think this is the time or the place to be frivolous. Hmm. You suggest a better time and place. This evening, maybe. Maybe. Mac, take care of this bunch, and I'll see what the other boys are doing. Okay, boys. Caught this baby trying to make a getaway. Says he's the manager of this joint. Hey, wait a minute. You can't pinch me. You ain't got nothing on me. Shut up. Take him down, and all the rest of them. Get in that line there. Now, just a minute now. Now, just a minute. Officer, I have something that looks like a pistol, but it really isn't. It's just a novelty that I carry cigarettes in. I'll confess, I held that guy with my both arms while this gent shot him. <laughs> Shut up. I'll tell you. Frontier model Colt, 45. No shells. Who runs this concession? Oh, I do. I don't suppose you ever saw this before. Well, yes, it's mine. I have a permit. But I haven't carried the gun for over a year. What do you want with a permit? Well, there was a guy out to get me, and I wanted it for protection. But, mister, you don't think that I... I think you're going to take a ride down to headquarters. You and this gun. This looks like the bird, all right. Yes, sir. Take him away, Jack. Come on, son. Well, listen, I... Shut up! Chief, I'm three hoppings full of dope. Well, you ought to know something about this. That's what Newgate was after, wasn't it? The frame-up. I don't know a thing about dope. Yeah, I suppose that's why you tried to run out on us before. Because you didn't know anything. 
Well, you'd better frame up a better story than that on your way downtown. Take him away, Ed. Come on. Come here, fellas. Ben! Hey! Get him! Howdy, Brian. Anything new? I've got one of those guys from the museum in there grilling them. Okay if I go in? I guess so, seeing it's you. Thanks, huh? You might as well spill it. We got the goods on you. Make it easy for yourself. And it's going to be a whole lot better for you if you come clean. I told you, I don't know nothing about it. This is your gun, isn't it? Yeah, but I tell you, I ain't seen it for a week. Well, where was it? I loaned it to a guy. What guy? Georgia, the armless artist. That armless guy? Well, that's a hot one. It's true. He was practicing for a novelty act. Shooting with his toes. On the level, he was. Sounds screwy enough to be true. It is true. On the level, it is. He might have done it. Or Pedro the Mexican. He's a crack shot. He was with me in Mexico back in 15. Oh, you made up your mind to talk, have you? Just trying to put the rope around your pal's neck. Well, let's hear a little more about you. You bought that gun for self-protection because there's a guy out to get you. Was that guy Newgate? No, I didn't have nothing against Newgate. I never even seen him. Well, what do you want? Brill just got through checking over the fingerprints on that gun. As a matter of fact, it isn't a fingerprint at all. It's a print from somebody's big toe. The armless artist. What in your arm? Oh, he's got a hand. I'm in all that. Take him away. I was right, wasn't I? Didn't I tell you? Round up that armless guy and bring him right in. Come on, boy. Give me the radio room. Boy, oh boy. Make him the killer and what a story it'll be, huh? <laughs> Too good to be true. But what a picture it will make with him holding a gun in his feet. <laughs> Well, what's the next move? Well, the boys are on the way in with this armless wonder. Well, we can declare a recess until he gets here. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> this is Snell. You what? Oh, it can't be. Wait, I'll be right up. Wait a minute. Let's have it. Jones, the ballistic expert. He has the bullet from the post-mortem. So what? Well, you remember we only found one gun and we went through that museum with a fine tooth comb. Yeah. Well, that was a 45 caliber. And Jones says the bullet that killed Newgate is a 32. What a scoop! Oh, holy God! <clears throat> with characteristic blundering, the police arrested two harmless museum employees before the caliber of the fatal bullet had been ascertained. We might suggest that investigation into the ranks of the police themselves might yield results, at least no more fruitless than those achieved by the pillaring of these victims of police inefficiency. Boy, and is our face red, huh? <laughs> Could the murder weapon have been smuggled out of the museum by someone free to come and go during the initial investigation of Newgate's slain? It is rumored that an officer stationed at the door owes his position in the department to appointment by administration higher That's up. A contemptible yellow sheet. Do you realize what they're trying to insinuate? Why, it sounds so fantastic. I left the museum shortly after the shooting to phone for an ambulance. That's what they're getting at. But, Uncle, no one could think that you... Would stoop to murder to get rid of my political opponent? Possibly not. But the Gazette would like to see me thrown out of office and would use any dirty, underhand means possible, this side of libel, to prejudice the voters against me. Oh, it's contemptible. The power of the press to make or break a man, telling the people what to think, to do, and to eat.
Oh, Jerry. Yeah? Have you seen the Gazette's latest dynamite? Yeah, I've read it. So is Brandon, I imagine. And if he has, he'll be forcing at the mouth. Hop over to his house and see what he's got to say. Okay, Chief. But say, uh, you better send over to the hospital and get some hydrophobia serum. I'm afraid I'm going to need it. Tell that pest I won't see him or any of his tribe. And if he comes here again, I'll kick him downstairs personally. Mr. Brandon regrets very much that he cannot stir. All right, Ethelbert. The acoustics around here are very good. Uh, very well, sir. Uh, this way, sir. Oh, Mr. Ross. Well, I was hoping I'd see you. I'm glad to see you, too. Let's sit down. I must talk to someone. I'm terribly worried. My ears are all yours, lady. What's the trouble? Well, it's about Uncle. Those dreadful things they insinuated about him in the papers. Oh, you mustn't mind a little editorial mudslinging. Why, every man in public life is accused of practically everything from mayhem to matricide. But they know that Uncle's hobby is target shooting. And he has a revolver in his collection like the one Mr. Newgate was shot with. A 32 smooth bore? They're almost an obsolete type. You don't believe that Uncle had... Oh, don't be silly. Of course not. But the, the best way to prove a man's innocent is to find the one who's guilty, if you know what I mean. I have an idea that when the police locate the man who telephoned for them, they'll know what this is all about. I don't understand. When the man phoned, he said, Blair Newgate has been shot proving that he knew Newgate. But here's the queer part. You remember, the police arrived immediately after the shooting, within a minute or so. So the man who phoned knew in advance that Newgate was to be killed and called the police before it actually happened. Could it have been the man who ran away? The, the manager? Carr? I don't think so. Oh, he had a motive, all right. But it doesn't seem likely that he'd wanted the police on his neck so soon if he was in on the job. Something tells me the key to the whole mystery is right there in the museum. They're, they're reopening it tomorrow, you know. Listen, if, if I could just find a place where I could watch that crowd, there's a law for rent right over the museum. Please, you're going too fast for me. Oh, all right, all right. I might be crazy, but it's quite possible the murderer might come back to get rid of any evidence that might be in there. I see. Listen. If I could just put a hole in the floor of that loft, I'll guarantee you I see plenty. Of course. Why, you're positively clever. I suppose we better get there early. We? Who's we? Why, you and me, silly. You don't think I'm going to be left out of this, do you? Well, I most certainly do. If you think I'm going to take you down... I'll to... meet you there. You will not. At uh, 11 o'clock. Now, listen, Lord. It is dangerous going there, so don't let's argue about it. Now, I'll have to be running along in a few minutes to pay a visit to a friend. It is both a surprise and a pleasure. It found me communing with Schopenhauer, into whose philosophy of pessimism I often delve. Won't you be seated? Thanks. Your library rather uh, surprises you, doubtless. Yes. 
One does not expect to find a bibliophile under the charlatan's robe. This is my other life. I presume you came in regard to the museum murder? Yes, I uh, wondered if you might have some theories about this case. Knowing that gang down there, you possibly could tip me off to something. I'm as much in the dark as you are. Oh, by the way, are those two unfortunates still in the hands of the police? Yes, they are, but they'll have to turn them loose unless something new develops. I have what you might call a theory. But I hesitate to state it. Oh, go on, Professor. Spill it. I'm not the police, you know. I mean, uh, you don't have to feel that you're implicating anybody. I'll keep whatever you say under my hat. Very well. It's just that uh, possibly the shooting of this Mr. Newgate was accidental. Accidental? Yes. You see, George, the armless boy, had a grudge against the Max, who was always taunting him about his misfortune. Mm. Oh, you mean that uh, he was aiming at the Max and hit Newgate instead? Oh, it's possible. Oh, no, that, that's out. Say, did you happen to notice what time it was when the shot was fired? It so happens that I did. I was about to begin my act. And as I always like to gauge the length of my performance, I looked at my watch. What did it say? Exactly 2.34. And an instant later, the shot rang out. Oh, then the shooting was... Uh... Wait a minute. Uh, are you positive it was 2.34? Sure you weren't fast? Absolutely. My timepiece is perfectly dependable. Oh, then the shooting was, uh, let's say, 2.35. And the police switchboard operator says the person who reported it telephoned at 2.29. Huh. Just six minutes before Newgate was shot. Well, I'm sorry to rush along, Professor, but I just got time to make the addition. Uh, do you know where I can find a phone? I believe the pharmacist, two doors west. Okay, thank you. I'll be seeing you. That's right. The police were notified of the Newgate killing about six minutes before he was shot. Isn't that a honey? And listen, here's another angle. It gives Brandon an alibi. He was with that friend of his, uh, uh, Judson. Yeah, they were probably on their way down to the museum. I called his office and he had just left. Yeah, okay. Hello? Yes, Judson speaking. What? I said, were you and Mr. Brandon together from the time you left headquarters until the time you went into the museum? Certainly, except for a moment when Mr. Brandon stepped into a cigar store near the museum to telephone. He did what? He telephoned just before we entered the museum. Oh, oh uh, thank you. Good morning. I thought I told you not to come. Well, you did several times. Did you get everything fixed? Yes, but you... Come on, then. Someone might see us if we stand here. Be overrun with them.
This is just about the spot where we can see everything. That wasn't such a tough job after all, was it? No, the worst part of it was keeping those shavings from going into the museum. Now I wish I could have a smoke. Well, why not? No one could ever smell it up here. Well, I guess for the first time in your life, you're right. You have one? Mm-hmm. Thank you. You see before you the exact spot where one of the most daring, cold-blooded murders in the entire history of this city occurred yesterday morning. What do you think of it? Who fired the shot? Well, I tell you, it's a shame. That's what it is. Jerry, somebody's watching us. Oh, now, now, listen. This place is getting on your nerves. Oh, I suppose so. What's the matter? Your mummy. Behind you, Jerry! Behind you! Right. There is something going on up there. Let go. How do you feel? Oh, great. Well, hello, Snell. Who invited you to this party? You did. You made so much racket up here, we thought the roof was coming down. Say, did he get away? The boys are looking for him now. Oh, I mean the Mexican. Mexican. This is all we found, Chief. Did you find the mask? No. Where does that door lead to? To the basement under the museum, then through a tunnel and up into the vacant store across the alley. Vance is over there now. Come on, I've got to phone this in. You kids had better stop playing Hawkshaw. It isn't healthy. Well, listen. Somebody has to suppress crime in this town. Come on, darling. All right.
All right, I'll be right over. Oh, say, Greeley. Yeah. Do you know where 1175 Pencold Street is? Sure, it's north, out to work. Did you say 1175 Pencold? Yeah. That's the old Burgess mansion. Don't you remember about six years ago, Emil Burgess took his bride there, and on their wedding night, the place has been vacant ever since. Nice little guy. Yeah. But a short while after, he suffered a little uh, throat trouble himself. Where were you asking? Oh, nothing, nothing. I, I just heard they were trying to sell the place. Oh, I see. Good evening, senor. Oh, where's the professor? I'm waiting for Professor Misto. He told me to come here at 8. What time is it now, please? Why, it's uh, 10 minutes of 7. You've got kind of a long wait, haven't you? Say, uh, if I'm not too inquisitive, what is the idea of you sneaking into the manager's office in the museum this afternoon? Well, I'm scared. I've seen a man today that I think that I see him nine or ten years ago in Mexico. Oh, when you were with Villa's army. You seem to know all about me, senor. I think the man is dead. Today I've seen him again. Mm, I don't suppose you had anything to do with his death. Uh, one has to protect himself, senor. Uh -huh. Well, I'm afraid I can't wait. When the professor comes, you uh, tell him I dropped in, will you? Well, it's a pleasure, senor. Where we put him? I see the chest there. Light the candle over there, will you? Hey, why the rough stuff? We had enough trouble before with the law on our tail. That weren't a mob knows we're trying to take it on a lamb with a load of dope. And they're out to hijack us. Before we can make our getaway. The Mex was double crossing us. Chief, I left the boys outside to watch for them. Take a look and see if everything's all right. I'm 
sure glad that mix is out of the way. Well, you didn't have to croak him, did you? What's eating you, Beggs? Wasn't he trying to sell us out to Werner? Sure. If Kate hadn't tipped us off, we might have got here about midnight and run into that whole mob of hijackers. Instead of that, it'll be us who are on the reception committee if they come. It'll be about three hours before the cars come for the getaway. But I'm going to be busy with a very nifty little skirt. So you birds will have to stand guard. Say you're crazy. You can't take a dame along. Listen. She's on her way right now. Oh, don't worry. I'll store her away upstairs if the fireworks start. She's beautiful, but dumb. I told her if she'd meet her young friend here, they'd get the goods on the new gate killer and clear her uncle. Wait a minute. Who tipped you off to this place? Landon Dame? Hardly. She wouldn't. She's too scared about her dear uncle to go shooting off her mouth. Well, you better tell us, buddy. Listen. It's 8.45. I'll give you till 8.50 to talk. Oh, you will? Well, you're wasting your time. By the way, Beggs there has a very persuasive way of making people forget to be tongue-tied. It'd be kind of too bad to spoil your looks. Have you got anything to tell us? Yes. Well, I thought you'd be reasonable. What is it? Oh, that's your attitude. Get some rope, we'll tie him up. You sure you're doing the right thing, boss? I'll do the worrying for this outfit. She's here. She's punctual, isn't she? Put him where he won't clutter up the scenery anymore. Get back outside, Vic. Well, where to? Take him up there. Come on. Better tie his ankles, fellas. A gallery seat for the show, Mr. Wise Guy. You boys wait in the kitchen. Come on, there might be a little food up there. Come on in, miss. Miss Brandon, I've been waiting for you.
You've pulled your last hijacking job, Gat Werner. Don't hi-hat me, sister. You've seen too much to be turned loose. Besides, I like you. We'll beat it down into Mexico. And have a swell time. Just you and me. Wait a minute. You all right, Dallas? Yes, I'm all right. Have you been here all the time? Yes. I heard him telephoning to her. And I figured he was getting ready to give me the air. Did he kill Newgate? No, he didn't dare. Not there in his own place. Come. You must leave here at once. The police are coming. Well, just a minute. I want to see if he has anything on him. Our friend in the loft. Come. Couldn't I give you a lift, Professor? No, thank you. I came in a taxi and I told the driver to wait. Good night. Good night, Professor. Joe, you drive. Where to, sir? 509 Darrow Street. darling. Good night now. And don't you have any bad dreams? But Jerry, aren't you coming in? No, I can't. I have a little sleuthing to do. What? Yeah, the address uh, the professor gave to that taxi driver wasn't his own.
Come in. Ah, oh, my young friend. I see you evidently enjoy late hours like myself. Won't you sit down? No, thanks. I heard you give the taxi driver the address of the museum. So I followed you. Rather ingenious, wasn't it? I merely fired a small bullet through this tube, inserted in the barrel of the gun the police found in the museum. They were quite baffled. And the only revolver they found was a 45, while the bullet was undoubtedly a 32. You mean you... I'll explain. The aid of an old revolver I have here. I'm sorry, Professor. If it wasn't for Miss Brandon's uncle... I know. I've already let the innocent suffer too much for my crime. I killed Blair Newgate. And I'm glad I did it. He deserved to die. Sit down. Somehow I'd like you to understand, if you can. Twenty years ago, a happier man than I didn't live. I was professor of philosophy in Weber University, married to the sweetest woman in the world. And Blair Newgate came to our town. He was handsome then. My duties compelled me to be away from home a great deal. My wife was lonely. And Newgate went away. I returned one evening home to find my wife's room locked. The smell of gas was in the air. A note saying she didn't care to live without him. On account of the unpleasant publicity, the trustees asked for my resignation. The next few years were hard. The doors were shut against me. At last, I was forced to turn a small knack for sleight of hand to account as a performer in a cheap carnival company. Recently, I read in the newspapers that Newgate was building a reputation as a crusader for civic righteousness. <laughs> I resolved to use that ambition as a means of bringing him within my reach. So I sent him a series of anonymous letters telling him of vice conditions that actually existed at the museum. These, as I had anticipated, finally led him there. The rest you know. Now, if you'll give me time to write a brief note to a dear friend before I go to meet whatever judgment or punishment awaits me. Of course. This might have been what is known as the perfect crime, had I thought of the rubber tips for the table legs in the first place. Just a moment, my friend. I'll be ready for the journey.
Professor. Professor. Well, Commissioner, now you have two reasons for throwing me out. After reading the morning papers, I realize that I owe you a debt of gratitude, young man. You've worked hard to help clear my name. Well, that was the general idea. But would you mind clearing up one little point for me? Why I telephoned that day? That's it. Boy, that had me worried plenty. It was in regard to my campaign for mayor. And I knew if I let any of you news hounds in on it, you'd mess up everything. Now, Commissioner... Well, you can spill it now. My manager was trying to swing the reform vote to me, and he was successful. But we didn't want to let Newgate in on it. Since the murder, I've been more or less under suspicion, so we couldn't say anything about it. Oh, boy, pardon me while I telephone, will you? Well, my dear... If you will insist upon marrying a newspaper reporter, you're destined to spend your balance of your life waiting outside of telephone booths. City desk, make a snappy, will you, honey? Hello? 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 I'm crazy about you, sweetheart. You're crazy, all right. Well, did you like the movie? I hope so. Because me, my wife Judy, and production manager Dan LeClaire, we enjoy bringing you these old black and white murder mysteries from the 1930s and 40s. And if you enjoy seeing them as much as we enjoy presenting them, we invite you to join us every Thursday and Friday night at 7 p.m. and other times during the week as our schedule allows. You can see the best of them right here, black and white murder mysteries on Hastings Mystery Theater. Good evening. <laughs>